All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the second order, uh, so I'll note that we have a quorum present. And the second item on the agenda is public comments, airport announcements, and recognition. I didn't have anybody sign up. Is there anybody who wants to, to address the board? All right, hearing none, I'll close the public comment section of the meeting. Item number three is discussion, consideration, and possible action to approve the minutes of the Guthrie Edmond Regional Airport Board meeting held on October 8th, 2024. The minutes were in your packet that was emailed to you and made part of the record. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? No. Hearing no additions or corrections to the minutes, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the October 8th, 2024? Summit. So a motion made by the law, seconded by the vice chairman. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, are you ready for the question? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and received the majority of those constituted, appointed to and constituting the board, the motion carries. Item number four is discussion, consideration, and possible action to approve the monthly financials. The monthly financials were posted to your packet. Are there any questions about the monthly financials of the director? Hearing no questions, is there a motion to approve the monthly financials? So moved. It's been a motion made by Member Wallace. There a second. second. There's been a motion made and seconded by Mr. Husky. Uh, oh, it's been laid upon the table. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Passed unanimously, having received the majority of those appointed to and constituting the board. Item number five, discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the 2020 fly and director job. Uh, yeah, I wanted to provide another update on this. I know we spoke about it at the last airport board meeting, and I told you I'd, I'd speak with uh, David Schultz Air Shows and get back with you. Uh, at this point in our discussions with city staff, the airport engineer, uh, and the contractor for our upcoming taxiway project, uh, we're not anticipating being able to host an annual event such as the fly-in um, or, or an air show uh, in 2025. However, um, if we were gonna go do a larger scale event such as an air show in 2026, um, this certainly gives us ample time to plan that and do so. I did have a call with David Schultz of uh, Schultz Air Shows and he's done air shows for uh, Reno and a host of other Oklahoma airports and they are incredibly expensive. Uh, to put on, but one of the benefits of that is that they take care of, they do all of the insurance, they'll do the parking on the ramp, they'll take care of the ticketing, uh, they'll get all the air bosses that would be needed for the event. They basically will just, you know, almost give them the airport facility to safely run the event like those professionals know how to do. And uh, we'll just be able to, you know, alleviate some of that work from staff to be able to host a, a large scale event like that. Uh, that being said, the, the financing and, and funding uh, for something like that would require a lot more donations than we've ever had historically. Uh, another thing that I appreciated David Schultz uh, sharing with me was that, you know, managing expectations for the community for the first air show. We're not going to see F-16s or, or Blue Angels, uh, but we wouldn't necessarily want something like that uh, for our first year. We want to start small, get some more amateur performers here, get used to running an event like that at our airport. It certainly can make uh, the professionals even more comfortable uh, growing the event after that. Um, but I did want to just include this on the agenda packet, provide an update um, as to hosting an event in the future that is more of an air show, aerobatics, and, and less of the, the fly-in. But we still would want to have that, that fly-in uh, component and, part, and you know, people can display their aircraft. So. So what, what is the anticipated date of the closing of the airport for building the parallel taxiway? Sorry, Mike. Okay. Uh, we are still working that out with our engineer and the contractor. Uh, there's four more airports, i told, that are ahead of us. Um, just in, in the way that we, the timing of when we bid the project, there's four airports that are working on other taxiways, aprons, that kind of stuff, and they are scheduled ahead of us. What we've told our engineer is that we want to 
uh, do the project in times that aren't peak, peak times for our airport. You know, that could be uh, the stuff going on down at the Lazy Arena, or obviously in the summertime, every airport across the state is much more busy than they are than in the winter. And so there are drawbacks to getting that project scheduled in the wintertime because you're not going to want to pour a lot of concrete um, in winter weather conditions. Uh, but we are looking at um, moving the runway closure portion of that project to the end of the project, which would hopefully put it into around this time next year is what we're looking at. But I don't have any hard dates uh, for the board at this time. Uh, once I get some firm uh, concrete information from Toby Baker and our team over at Park Hill, I'll make sure that he comes to the board and kind of explains what's gonna be going on to you all so that you all are informed. And once again, I, I know I've said this probably four or five times now, uh, we are gonna have a airport town hall of sorts and try to get a lot of airport community engagement uh, so that everyone's aware of what we're doing, when we're doing it, and just kind of combat that misinformation that we've seen at the airport as far as the runway closure goes. So one time we talked about March of 2025, that's been pushed back from, and that's not a, that's not obviously a feasible timeline if they've got four ahead of us. Yeah, so we're now looking at, and, and every date that I throw out at you is going to be, it's not a solid date, I want to preface, but we're looking at beginning in March 2025. We were originally hoping to do the runway closure portion. Uh, that's just going to be the portion of the project where we're connecting the stubs of the new taxiway to the existing runway. Uh, we were going to do that at the very beginning, and we know that if they start in March, they're going to have to have, I think, at least one phase before they get into that. So that's going to put us in May or June, and that's not when we want to be closed. So we've worked with them to move it to the end of the project. And so that would put us in, um, that could be November, December, January. Of 2026. The, the, January 26, December 25. November 25. All right. So, um, one of the possibilities for funding that I mentioned to you, and I talked to the other sales professor at UCO, is using the um, sales practicum class as the service that um, that would go out and sell sponsorships uh, for the air show and the fly-in, and that's definitely a possibility according to the professor who runs that. We would have to give a commission to the students because the DOL is pesky about like, you know, you can't work for free uh, anymore. The, the days of interns working for nothing are, are long gone, but they, they could be paid um, strictly commission-based. We could explore that. And I wanted to ask legal about if there are any issues that we have to have if we use that as a class project for selling sponsorships through the sales center. I'll be looking for that. Okay, all right. Uh, also, along with that, I went to the International Aerobatic Association's um, National uh, Finals in Salina, Kansas, with John Weiss, who is a CFI on the field, and we talked to the guy who runs that, and they are interested in starting uh, a competition again in Oklahoma. There was a competition for years and years and years, and then the chapter of the IAC that was in Oklahoma sort of became inactive. And so we're looking at reviving that chapter and maybe having that as part of the air show event. And then also I attended the national um, short takeoff and landing finals, which was a week ago in Sulphur Springs, Texas. And they are also very interested in doing an event at KGOK. And they stole might be actually a better fit because you can actually see that with the aerobatic, you don't get a lot of attendance because of the height requirements, the box where they'd have to put it. It's harder for spectators to see, but the stole is like right there. Um, and the economic impact, they have some <laughs> studies on the economic impact of the stole competitions and what it brings to a community. And it's a significant uh, amount. I think I provided you with the contact for uh, the director of the National Stole. Yes, and, and one thing I, I did want to mention on the financing portion, uh, one of the things that David Schultz was telling me about was that 
our current flying in, excuse me, before our current flying begins, we had, we try to have anywhere from seven to 10 grand in our, what we call our airport donations fund. It's, it's looks like it's in our maintenance and operating budget, but it really operates separately from that. And let's just make sure that when everyone, when a, when a pilot out here decides to cut a check to the airport uh, to promote aviation education activities or a flying event, it goes directly into that account. Uh, we try to have seven, like I said, we try to have seven to 10 grand uh, for something like a large scale air show. We're going to be looking at 50 grand or we're going to be getting up into those, those higher numbers. And uh, one thing that Mr. Schultz recommended at that point with that amount of money is putting it in some kind of special nonprofit volunteer fund that's overseen itself, just because, uh, you know, when we talk 50 grand, we're talking, you know, one city's total contribution for the maintenance and operation of this airport is $150,000. And so we're talking a third of, of the city's portion. And we don't want to show that all of a sudden, you know, we can come up with 50 grand to, to buy mowing equipment. It needs to be set aside separately just for the, the fly-in and ensure that that money is being allocated uh, correctly. I did want to throw that out there. And, and I agree that something like the stole might be a, a better leap forward. Uh, that's less drain of a resources than going all the way for the eventual air show, which I do believe that it would be super beneficial to the community to see something like that. I've just never personally put one on. And so it, it's a lot of a uh, large learning curve on my part, learning. I want to make sure uh, we have it all figured out before we so get going. The stole is technically not an aerobatic maneuver. Right. You have to have an air box. You don't have to have a box. So you know, no. You, that might be the jump they, they, first. They do have an air boss that will Run coordinate them. traffic. Right and ramp traffic, but they don't have to have a box right. for the, which the, the air box, box. Yeah, the box is the harder thing to get. Um, you can get a temporary box for an aerobatic competition that lasts just during the event, um, but it's still a lengthier process to, to get it through. To get the, the, it's a the kilometer square. Right. So they have the old aerobatic competition one that held the page back in the day. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they still have a yeah. box that you can call the FAA open and open and have it at any time. Yeah, yeah. I've got to there for the eighties. Yeah. Um, and that is more difficult to get to get a permanent uh, box that, that is you know, openable. Okay. Right. Yeah, openable on demand is, is a harder to figure. Really, it's what I've been told. Never tried to get one. So, well, I know they still come to practice there sometimes, or at least they have in the past years. Uh, for because of that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, two things. Thing one $50,000 seems like a giant leap to me um, for an air show, and we don't even know what we might get to perform. Uh, I like the stole idea. We had one at Westheimer, and it was amazing. It's really fun to watch these pilots come in and land in 20 feet or whatever. It's pretty crazy. So maybe that, instead of calling it an air show, just come watch this event. Um, Start calling people or something like that. Maybe just kind of a, laying a foundation for events at the airport. Thing two, I'm not sure that this is really here, but you mentioned something in your commentary a moment ago about um, runway closure, doing the project at the runway, and you said that there, we would be like number four in line. I, I guess I don't understand that. When you put a project out for bid, how am I number four in line? Is there only one contractor doing the work? So how we, does that happen? We contracted Libra Electric, and Libra is you know large. They have multiple teams, but their teams are tied up in projects right now. There's four other projects that were bid earlier than ours that were awarded to Libra, similar size airport, similar size project. And so once they complete the projects that they've done now, they're going to start on the four. They're, we're just we're we just happen to be fifth in line. And I, I would tell you, Walt, that you know. We could have, if only we would have gone with another bidder, but we only had one bidder for the entire project. And so we're kind of stuck with what the bidder we got uh, in Libra. And we're happy with their work. We've seen their work across the state. Oh, yeah. But um, it is unfortunate that 
we just happened, it just was the most fair system uh, that they have when they have four projects waiting to be done across the state. Ours is number five. Um, to be completely honest, though, I think going into the winter, um, we're certainly not ready to probably dive into a project in the middle of winter now. And coming out of the spring, um, it could hurt. You know, we want to make sure that our businesses have enough ample time to prepare for the financial setback of a runway close for 30 days. And so it is buying us more time on the project. And I, I share the same frustrations that you have. Uh, but that's just what I've been told by our engineers at this time. So a runway closure has to be, it can't, can it not be, could it not be a uh, taxi back, you know, doing U-turns on the runway and taxi back? Or is it because of the construction for the taxiway and the equipment and the dirt, you know, it all gets into the safety area to a place where... <clears throat> You can't have anything going on. Yeah, so we, we are probably going to see some back taxi uh, procedure, procedures at some point during a portion of the phasing process. But because of the amount of crews that they'll have in the safety area while they are um, pouring concrete for the stub at the end of the runway to the new taxiway, there's just going to be so much equipment, materials, and personnel there that they're just going to have to close uh, the entire the, the entire portion of the runway while they're making those connections. For, and we looked at, you know, could we break that up into phasing? Uh, what other stuff could we do to limit that? And we just thought, you know, that's going to end up being a communication and phasing nightmare. And so we just thought, you know, we'll do this all in one swoop. We'll let everyone know with ample amount of time. And we will know definitively that for that period, for that 30 days, the runway is closed. So, okay. And that's just when we're connected the taxiway to the runway itself. Yeah, the, an entire project is going to be a is going to be a two hundred and forty day project. There's going to be, you know, uh, we focus a lot on the thirty days because that is what's going to be most impactful to us. But there will be major construction going on at this air, airport facility uh, during for two hundred and forty days. Yeah. So I guess. Um, Regarding the possible action, uh, the fly-in this last year was held on September 7th. Why is it that we don't think that we can hold a fly-in in September if we're not looking at the runway closure until I don't know that for sure. December? Yeah, I, I don't know that for sure. We definitely, once we get a more concrete timeline uh, from Libra and Park Hill, we can kind of figure out when we can maneuver all of this. But right now, since there's so many unknowns and, and uncertainties, I don't want to I don't want to get too far down the line with um, a stole operator or whoever we need to talk to and then have to yank it back last minute because of our construction phasing that I don't know about yet. Um, I just wanted to say on the baseline for now, we can just assume that we're going to have to wait till 2026, but if something clears up, we'll try to have it in 2025. Uh, I enjoyed having it. I think the community loved it. And so I, I would love to have it in 2025, but I don't want to just want to manage expectations about where we're going to be in this project. Right. And, and when I talked to the Stoll, uh, National Stoll Competition, they said that it would be very tight to try and get and not impossible, but it'd be very tight to try and get a competition scheduled in 2025 with their current schedule. So they were looking at 2026, but I didn't know why we would need to cancel all of it, given the fact that um, the, the fly-in really is, it's not like it's a huge taxing deal if, we, if the airport is open. Um, and it sounds like we're not going to be closed. So that, that, that there's not a potential for them closing in September based on the timeline that we've got currently. So I hate to like have an action item to cancel the fly-in now, given the right. fact that we're we're probably not going to be. I, I can't foresee based on what you've said a rationale for closing in September that they just would they would not be far enough along. No, yeah. I I would recommend just no action on this item. Okay, all right. So are there any further questions or comments about the 2025 fly? Yes. I'd like to see, maybe we could keep it on the calendar because just to fly in and open house, that's something that we could cancel easily without, if we have to, 
without you know canceling a stall competition. Right. For the crib. Yeah. Hold that for another year, but maybe keep the the twenty twenty five fly in like you had here recently. Keep that on the calendar with the knowing that if we have to, we can shut that puppy off in a week's time. Uh, just put the notice out. But we keep the keep it on the calendar so it's known about. And that's more or less what you said. Right. That I, I think that's doable. Better. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there are there are airports that host blinds on like airport mm -hmm. breakfasts and things like that. So I, I I would I would prefer to see that to just kind of keep the momentum that we've built mm -hmm. with I think the last one was definitely the most successful fly in since I've been you know, coming to fly at every airport, which is a long time. I think it was definitely you know, a huge deal and you know, the community really came out and supported in the big way. So. For now, we'll take no action on um, item number five and we'll just see how things progress with the, with the construction projects that we have going on. Does that sound okay with everybody? Yeah, yeah that's a good one. So, no action taken. Item number six, discussion, consideration, and possible action to transfer the assignment of a lease for hangar number 11 from Michael Ross Cook to the Kinzer Family Trust, Director Young. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill Kinzer is a current tenant at the airport with an airplane currently in a T hangar. Uh, Mr. Kinzer is seeking to purchase hangar number 11 from Michael Ross Cocky. I have met, <coughs> excuse me, I have met with Bill and Ross to review the lease. He is aware of the lease terms and the other terms of the agreement with the city. Uh, the original lease agreement began in 2002 and ends in 2032, uh, but with two five year options for renewal. Uh, so that would put the hangar reversion, uh, potential reversion, back to 2042. Uh, therefore, there's 18 years left on the lease uh, for 1,681 square feet uh, hangar site. Uh, Mr. Kinzer is here today to answer any questions that the board uh, may have regarding the lease assignment. Upon approval, staff will put this to the Guthrie City Council uh, at the November 17th meeting next week. Are there any questions? No? Okay. There are uh, motion to approve. Yes. Okay. <laughs> There's been a motion made by Member Husky. Is there a second? There's been a motion made and seconded by uh, Mr. Wallace and laid upon the table. Is there further discussion? If not, are you ready for question? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Have received the majority of those appointed to constitute the board. The motion carries, and that will be placed on the Guthrie. Uh, City Council agenda for the first meeting or the second meeting um, in, in November. Yeah, yeah. I'm losing track of my days. It's been, it's been a long day. I apologize. Uh, item number seven: discussion, consideration, possible action to approve the purchase of phase one camera system upgrades from advanced surveillance, the amount of seven thousand dollars. Uh, as the board is aware, safety and security is a top issue at any airport. Um, I wouldn't even want to try to sum the value of all 124 aircraft uh, that's located out here. Our, cur our current airport camera system is over 15 years old, and as problems arose, we didn't really have the, the budget uh, to fix those systems as they should have been. Um, well, it's not this bad, but we kind of just put duct tape over the problem and moved on. Uh, the city of Guthrie uses advanced surveillance uh, for security cameras, and they have been timely and communicative when it comes to issues at our airport. Uh, we ask them to come up with an estimate to overhaul the camera systems that we have and replace that technology, and even add a camera to the rotating beacon, uh, because we currently don't have coverage on any of the runway ends. Uh, the total project cost uh, to upgrade our cameras are, is nearly $11,000. Um, with the upcoming capital projects and other airport expenses, uh, we split the projects up into two phases with advanced surveillance. In FY26, so next budget year, uh, we're going to request an additional $4,000 to install closure boxes around the airport uh, because currently a lot of the existing camera systems are within hangar units. 
And that's just something generous that the airport hangar owners did. Uh, they allow us to run the electric, they allow us to put it in their hangar. Um, but sometimes that can cause issues with the fact that you know, we might need access uh, into that hangar to get access to our camera equipment, uh, but they might be out of town. And so they're not able to get to it. So that poses a security problem. And so what we have here, this is a really um, poorly made map, I apologize, but this is just the best map we had to show the phasing. It might be a little difficult to see, but each red dot um, is an existing camera at our airport, except for the red dot um, in the north area where that's located on our rotating beacon. And so all phase one is going to do is it's gonna be uh, repairing, reinstalling the camera system and, and the camera framework infrastructure around our terminal. And then it's going to add that camera to the beacon. And then next year I'll come back before the board um, when our when our great city manager lets me put the 4,000 into our budget for the next fiscal year. Um, and I can work on getting the rest of these cameras. <coughs> and just as a another reason that we need to move on this is actually last, this was a, a well-timed agenda item because last week uh, we had heavy winds and storms and the camera, one of the camera receiver poles that was on top of our terminal actually blew down and the metal pierced the roof of this building and it caused leaks in my office and in the FBO. And so I am without uh, cameras to uh, a lot of the hangars on our facility. And we have, you know, people are able to enter the airport uh, all the time just by piggybacking on someone going through the gate. And, and so it is a main, it is a large security issue with all of the aviation assets that we have out here. And so uh, what I'm asking for the board today is to approve uh, phase one uh, so that we can begin upgrading our camera systems. Is that going to put Wi-Fi out for everyone too? I don't believe it's going to do that. How are they run it on Wi-Fi? Probably a closed network, right? Well, you'd have to run wired each one if you didn't have a... What, a Wi-Fi network that was closed, that was secured. All right. Right. So it says Wi-Fi in here, but it's a secured Wi-Fi. It's not a public Wi-Fi, right? Sounds like it could be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about installing a camera. You said on the rotating beacon. On the rotating beacon, so the camera is going to be running at the same pace as the beacon. <laughs> no, sir. It'll be on just the the pole that the beacon is on. It'll be mounted onto that, so that it just has constant surveillance of the runway end of one six. Okay. Is it a PTZ camera? And to um, zoom? I couldn't tell you. I it is. I, I believe so. It's not one of the fancy. You know, a lot of airports and, and places have those fancy fish hook cameras that can go down and, and do all kinds of 360 turns. But I mean, it, it'll have the capabilities of resistant cameras. I'm wondering about that alternating red or white and green flash that comes around into the camera's view, even if it's shining above. Each time the beacon comes around, wouldn't that wash out the what the camera sees? I mean, it might light I, I don't think it'd be high enough that it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect the, if the camera's on the pole itself and you got the beacon above and they shine out. I don't think it'll affect it. Well, to answer your question, two of the cameras on the quote are PTC cameras. Okay. Um, I don't know where they're located on the installs. It doesn't give me that, that detail, but it does show two cameras. One's a 25 times zoom camera and the other is a... Uh, just shows a, a dual lens. I don't know what the zoom of the two lenses are, but there's two PTC cameras. Color goes black and white at night, probably. They both say night vision capable, yeah. So the one on the even how much of the runway does that cover? Um, how much how, how much? And then I guess we have another camera. Um, it looks like maybe on the FBO that covers the south end. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so and we all of these cameras we have we have existing camera views of. Um, we can see who's going through both gates. We can see who's coming around. We can see over by these T hangers and over by this box hanger. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure exactly how much of the runway it will cover. I would imagine it would get a good view of the last thousand feet 
um, of the runway. When we were looking at doing this, it was it was primarily just in that we didn't have any camera coverage of really the runway at all. I can tell you the, these cameras right here don't really get a good view of the runway, just what you see on the ramp. And so we wanted to have some some ability uh, to have some footage uh, of what's going on on the runway. Looks like we still need one to cover three four. Yeah, we, we didn't, you know, and, and to Walt's point, you know, when we, we thought about the beacon, it kind of was the only piece of infrastructure that's that's close to the, the runway to put something on. We don't have anything really by 3-4. But the great thing about upgrading these cameras, too, is that they're going to be much more in line with the camera systems that we're eventually going to need to install on the new terminal. And maybe when we have the new terminal, you know, it's going to be back over here. I and mean, we're not going to see the end of 3-4 on it, but we can at least get closer to having something on that south end. Is that white vertical line uh, across your photograph? Is that the built line? No, no. I'm sorry. What this is, this is just trying. It's trying to highlight what phase one is. Phase one cameras are this camera, and then these cameras around the terminal. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really confusing. I don't know. This was the map that we were sent by advanced surveillance just to show that what's in the white line is phase one, and then the rest is all phase two. Okay. Thanks. Looks like seven cameras total on this quad, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All, all external, all outside. Yes, sir. Is there any further discussion? Uh, is there, I will entertain a motion to approve uh, the purchase of phase one camera system upgrades from advanced surveillance, the amount of 7,000. I, I move to uh, approve also. Second. There's a motion made by Member Young, seconded by Member Wallace. Is there any further discussion? If not, are you ready for the question? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. I receive the majority of those appointed to and constituting the board. Motion carries unanimously. Item number eight discussion, consideration, and possible action to approve the annual subscription of an airport operations tracking service in the amount of $1,200. Director. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I'm very excited um, about this system and to share it with you uh, today. Uh, I can't wait to share its, its capabilities and the implications it could have for our airport. Uh, at its core, uh, this system, 1200 Arrow, uh, automatically logs airport operations. Uh, these can be landings, takeoffs, go arounds, and overflights. Uh, many of you have, have heard my story about our first uh, ODAA uh, inspection. Uh, when we were going through and updating our master record, our current master record says that we have 63 operations annually. And they asked me if that was still correct. And I said, no, we actually have 2,000. <coughs> and I said, 2,000? Show, show me the data that that's true. And I said, well, I can't show you the data that 63 is true. And the reason that is is because that was the best guesstimate short of hiring someone to stand out near the runway all day and, and count the traffic that we have. And so what this system is, it's going to allow us to, it, it reads ATSB uh, data and it logs it into this system and so that we can track these operations. Uh, in a second, I'm going to log into a example site that will show you exactly uh, what we'll be looking at. And I also wanted to say that uh, Air Ardmore, Bartlesville, and Enid, are all looking at adopting a system like this. Uh, the precursor to this system was, was called uh, Bird Tower. Uh, I'm giving you more information than you need, but the previous system was called Bird Tower, and it was just frankly too expensive for airports our size. GA airports couldn't afford it. And a lot of these systems like Viochi uh, and, and people can do FlightAware premium subscriptions, uh, they pro all provide roughly the same data, uh, but this system uh, provides it at a great uh, price for us, especially with all of its capabilities, which I'll, I'll share with you now. If my mouse works. So the previous estimates were what we sometimes refer to as a swag. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll try to get my, my head out of the way here. So what we're looking at is this is Miami International Airport, live right now. 
obviously just a teeny bit bigger than our own, just a little. Um, you can see all of these, all these planes are, are switched on, all the ATSB is what it's tracking. We have terrain, OSM, we can see VFR, IFR, and have a satellite view here, uh, pretty cool. Uh, there's also reports that we can generate and so this is something that I could include in the airport board packet. Um, each month I could show uh, what were our landings and takeoffs that month. Um, it provides all sorts of really cool data uh, that we, we've never had before. Uh, I can, you know, we're obviously going to have just two runway ends, um, but we can see, we can track all of that. We can track it by type. We can track it by engine type. And we can also see where our origin and destinations are. And so we, whenever we go to do our SWOT analysis uh, during our next airport board retreat, we can ask ourselves, you know, what are these other airports doing uh, that's attracting people? Over back to you, this is a no-brainer. And we haven't even gotten to half of its capabilities yet. <laughs> um, we have a local versus itinerant. We can see training. You know, we're a big training airport. An airport our size has three uh, flight schools here. I mean, that's huge. So we can see that. Uh, after hours ops, um, we're, we're very excited to have our FBO, but let's say we didn't have an FBO. We had to go out for one. We could see uh, when, are, when are we seeing the most activity? And then we can put in our minimum standards and say, whenever we put out that RFQ, we can say, look, we, we need an FBO that's willing to service these hours that we have. So that's enough about, that's enough numbers for me and reports that we can run. Another really cool thing it can do, if you'll let me load it, uh, for Miami International Airport, it's tracking their tower uh, operations. It will also track our CTAF for up to a year and store it. And so if we had an incident, we could hear what was happening. Uh, one thing that I worry about is my one airport maintenance and operations guy. Uh, the one thing that could happen every single day out here is someone could land without calling on the radio which they're not really required to do, and he could just not be paying attention, and then we have a catastrophe. And so, uh, well, obviously, I would never want that to happen. With the camera that you all just approved to put on the beacon to look at runway 16, we have better visuals. But we can also tie that into uh, what's being said over the aircraft radio, and like where where proper procedures called. I don't know if it'll play it for me over here. Uh, we can see an airspace replay, so I can go back at any time of the day and see um, what aircraft we're operating at over the airport. Uh, I can put in our based aircraft, uh, so we can tell um, how many times that they're operating. It can tell you uh, their overnight stays and the days active. I think that this could come in handy when we sign a 25-year lease agreement with an individual and they come back for renewal in the future. And we say, well, we logged on to here. We've had this system for 25 years and you've operated three times. Um, what, what's our justification uh, for you to continue expanding operations here? And so we, it's a way that we can track what's going on and, and see what our based aircraft are doing. This is also really cool. Uh, there is over, and our city manager might want to correct me if I'm wrong, there's over 900 homes um, that are going to be constructed in the city of Guthrie. Uh, I have not received that many noise complaints while I've been at this airport. I'll tell you at my previous airport, I received maybe four or five a week. Um, but here at this facility and the year and a half I've been here, I probably had four noise complaint calls. And while there's not really much I can do, it is nice because I can put in their address. I can put in when it happened, uh, roughly their altitude. And from there, I can, this system will allow me to pinpoint up to 30 nautical miles outside of the airport, what aircraft that was. But more importantly, what it does is I can drop a pin on that area. And as more and more people call in noise complaints, I can then use this map to show our, our city planning office or any other city office that this area being residential, um, we, are not, we are not serving this area well because we're having a high density of noise complaint calls. So we can see those areas that we can, we can mitigate in the future. Uh, let's see. Oh, come on. It's not wanting to play nice with me. Uh, but one thing it can also do is it will track uh, safety events. And so if we have someone that lands without using the radio, I can see uh, their tail number. So I can see if someone's 
doing that a lot, even though they're not required, might give them a call and just explain to them how important that is for the safety of, of our personnel operating out in the airfield. Uh, but it will also tell me if someone landed and came in for emergency. And so I can see that. And then I can, once again, I can pull up that camera feed that we received from the beacon. Uh, lastly, the last thing I wanted to say about this system uh, was that this is the what they call the public view of the system. So this is something we would put in the pilot lounge and it would just basically give, it, it's just a public view where you can see what's going on at the airport in real time. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be as busy as Miami International, uh, but this could be a really cool feature for visiting pilots to just kind of see and, and watch what's coming in. And so with that, I can take any questions and I hope you uh, approve this system for our airport. So does this piggyback off of like a flight aware or something? It it, you know? it I don't know too much of the differences between this and flight aware, but it does uh, track uh, ATSB uh, data. There, the first question that the company usually gets that I'm told is, "What about non-ATSB aircraft? Um, those aircraft that are still equipped um, with some sort of uh, GPS system, they can figure out its altitude." but they can't figure out where it went after it landed. And so for example, they can figure out it came down to the runway at our airport, but it, but if someone has their, uh, after they land at the airport, they might be taxiing all the way to their hangar. With ATSB, we can see exactly where they went, but with non-ATSB, it's a little bit more dicey and difficult. Uh, but one airport I'm told had to show a certain amount of operations to the FAA to get funding for a longer runway. And they had the amount of operations but they had to include non-ATSB aircraft in it. And this system doesn't, can't, direct, can't track that as well. And I'm told that the FAA actually allowed it because they could prove that a landing and, a landing and takeoff did take place. An operation occurred uh, regardless of where it went after, after it might have landed, if that makes sense. So this has always been a challenge for non-towered airports. Yes. <clears throat> it's just difficult. And it's always been a swag for 130 airports across the state of Oklahoma. Um, you say ATSB? ADSB. A A A A A A A I'm sorry. Okay. Very good. good. I, was, I was hoping I got that to it go was ADSB. I know I'm out of the loop. No, they didn't say that. that far out. I apologize. So does anybody know, can anybody say what the requirements are today? Because my last input was probably six years ago about what the requirements are for an aircraft to have ADSB. an ADSB. It's very similar to what <coughs> you used to have to have for a C transponder to fly at a high speed. Yeah. So basically right. if you're flying into any kind of controlled airspace, especially class B, you have to have it before you Yeah, but we're far from class B. No, it's not a requirement. They can turn it off and do the whole thing. I think, don't you have to have mode C for, for the Charlie? Yeah, uh, I, thought you'd have, yeah. I thought you had to have ADSB. Well, not necessarily, as long as you make a phone call, you can still fly into that controlled airspace. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's such a burden to do that that if you're going to fly into the Charlie very often, most people will go ahead because it's not that expensive to put a beacon no. on your on your plane to get ADSB out. And a lot of them, unless you program it right, you ask the radio guy, some of them have it where as soon as they touch down, it switches it off. Mm -hmm. The big guys know. And a concern that I would have also, and I'm not, this looks magnificent. I mean, it's wonderful. But um, will the closest ASR, airport surveillance radar, that would be capable of reading this ADSB input would be Will Rogers, would it not? That's the closest ASR in this area. I don't know that, that their radar is going to reach to the surface here. I guess my question is, does it matter? Because really, this is advisory, not, not, uh, we're not, we're not controlling anything with this data. We're just using this as data to help us to determine out airport operations and, and the like, right? Okay. So it's, but my it's, point is, is if the radar doesn't reach it, then the radar can't see it, it won't read it, it won't show up. Well, that's the equipment they're installing. Yeah, I mean, if you look at well, like how many airplanes show up on ADSB, I mean, if you're looking at FlightAware or any other data, I think this is running on the same backbone using ADSB data from what I was able to read about on this when I looked it up before I came here. Okay, it's using the same ADSB data that, that everything else is. Yeah. So, so stuff that doesn't have an ADSB transceiver in it isn't going to show up on this system or FlightAware or right. anything else. It will show up on terminal radar, but it's not going to be. It's not going to show up here. 
But again, this is a tremendous amount of data, even if it's 95% accurate instead of 100% accurate, like, like it would be if it was included terminal radar. Um, what a fantastic data source for the airport to be able to attract, you know, all kinds of different things like uh, people to the FBO or uh, to, to, to attract, um, you know, well, for air shows, things like that. Here's how much traffic our airport generates. Don't hear me wrong. Yeah. I'm all for this. I think yeah. it's magnificent if we can get some coverage. But uh, too many years in the air traffic business, understanding ASR, understanding ADSB, mm -hmm. understanding transponders, mode C, that whole banana. And I still, somebody's going to have to educate me because I still think it's required. The ASR coverage at that ground level is going to be needed to show that up. The, they say, so once we approve this, uh, if you approve it, um, they're going to send me an antenna uh, that will be placed on the top of this terminal. Uh -huh. and they assure me that any traffic within 30 nautical miles of this airport will be tracked. Um, now, what they're hoping to do and expand in their business is as Enid gets this and Bartlesville gets this and other airports get it, they can, what they're working on doing is, you know, as an airport leaves our facility and it goes over to Enid, uh, they don't, how they track it on our system is going to be different than Enid's. And they're looking at how did they mesh all of that into one cohesive mm -hmm. system where all the data is tracking itself. And so they're hoping to grow, like I said, they're uh, fairly new. It was an airport a uh, pilot major and a computer science major uh, that met in college and they knew that bird tower existed and they thought we can do this for much cheaper for GA airports than, you know, paying six, six, over six grand a year uh, to try to get half of, half of the capabilities that this offers. Well, with new technology we have today, this is not surprising. I'm glad to see it's finally here. Me too. I'm pretty well everybody's got ideas. Yeah, it's a public system, and anybody can participate in it. You can build your own. Um, you can build your own ADSB receiver connected to the internet, and you become a a uh, hub for ADSB traffic. You can do that at your house if you like. Um, anybody can do that, and it adds um, it adds to the uh, to the ADSB receiver network. So it's it's using receivers all over the place. This would just be another one. I've got a lot to learn. <laughs> For further discussion on item eight, uh, is there a motion to approve the annual subscription of the airport tracking service in the amount of $2,200? So there's been a motion made by Mr. Strong, this a motion seconded by uh, Mr. Member Young. Motion made laid upon the table. Is there further discussion? If not, are you ready for the question? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Continue to share the aye cover and receive the share of the points for the House to reward the those who pass it. Item number nine discussion, consideration, and possible action to approve the subleasing policy for airport hangers directly the Um Can I ask the chair really quick what the motion and, and second was for that? The list? motion I was. Uh, Member Strong to pass item number eight, seconded by Member Young. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, Friday number nine, at the last airport board meeting, we discussed the subleasing policy for the airport. I told the board that I would host a public meeting for tenants that had questions, comments, concerns about the policy. Uh, the meeting was held on Thursday, October 31st at 1 p.m. right here in this room. Uh, we only had three attendees, unfortunately, the FBO and two T hanger owners. Uh, the, I promised you all that I would come back and provide feedback. Uh, the majority of the feedback I received uh, was that they believe uh, the, that the policy overstepped uh, what was originally written in the leases and that uh, this was a little too much uh, overreach from the airport office. I think the largest argument against this policy is that we have the power to enforce the leases as written now uh, without this policy. Uh, my recommendation to the board today is going to be to let staff finalize the hangar inspection process uh, where I believe I'll be ready to present uh, findings at the uh, January airport board meeting and we can make determinations as to what is needed then. Um, I've already added quite a few based aircraft into our system uh, since we started the hangar inspections. Um, I don't think we're even a 15th of the way done. Uh, it's pretty difficult uh, scheduling 100 and 
more over, what is it, 114 hangar units uh, across the airport. Um, but we are getting a lot of people on the schedule. Uh, we've already identified um, some other businesses operating on the airport uh, that we weren't aware of. And, you know, that's just comes down to enforcement uh, on the airport. So we're collecting that insurance, we're collecting that information, and we're keeping it on file. And we're slowly building a more accurate picture of, of what's happening uh, at the airport. And that's why I think it's important that we go ahead and get all these hangar inspections completed uh, by my office and, and staff today. And then I will present those findings to the board. And I think we can use those findings to craft a better policy if we think one is one is needed. Um, but it was a productive discussion uh, with the hangar owners and the FTO. And, and I think we have the steps, we know the steps that we need to take uh, to move forward. So I guess one of the things that um, I think about when I think about this policy is that as I have reviewed cases <coughs> over the course of my tenure, that we have sort of a hodgepodge of lease language that has been used for various people over you know, the last 20, 30 years. The one thing that's consistent um, in the leases that I've looked at is a paragraph that says that you are subject to all regulations, rules um, of you know, the federal government, the state, and, and the airport. Um, and so since there isn't necessarily consistency in, but there is consistency with statements of you have to follow the rules, regulations, and policies, I think that the policy development and implementation is important to standardize what is otherwise disparate language across various versions of leases. Does that make sense? Yeah, with granularity that actually defines all the things that should be in every lease going forward, but basically right. that works retroactively by leveraging that policy that says that all, all of the leases have to be. Because that's about the only thing that I can find standard in, in, in yeah, all the versions that. of the leases is that there is a, a reference to you have to follow the rules, regulations, laws, you know, governing the airport and policies that are developed by the board. Um, so I, I guess I take it that uh, your position right now is that in compiling that information from the tenants that participated, you're not ready to adopt a policy today, right? But we're working towards developing that policy. Yes, and I and I I completely as the policy is written today, I, I believe it's included in all of your packets. If you want to review it, it's the exact same policy I put before the board last month. Um, I, I agree with the terms of the policy, uh, but I also want to make sure that whenever we put this policy forward, I have a very clear picture of what's going on in every hangar unit. And I think as I start the, before we, we pass the policy, I'd like to have these one-on-one -on -one discussions with these hangar owners about what we're expecting of them, even without the policy in place. And so that way I can go and say, you know, we're going to try to rectify the issues that we can as they exist. And let me get all your information down and just know that at some point we're going to be looking at making a more standard process for all of this. So it's good that we got you taken care of now uh, because there are uh, more changes. And when I say changes, uh, that's exactly as, as you worded it, just to make sure that every lease is, is unified across the board. Yeah. I'd like to point out that while they're considering some, some students are considering this an overreach, I think you're also having some that are considering your airport inspection an overreach. But we have to have a full picture of what's going on at this airport. Well, I think for, the, for grant purposes, we're required to do the inspection and make sure that we have hangers that are being used for aviation purposes and not for storage of non-aviation related. You know, if there has to be an airplane in the hangar. Absolutely. And then this is such a common issue. We've talked about it, you know, for, for months now, but this is such a common issue at airports. I spoke to uh, an airport manager of an airport much larger than ours uh, just yesterday. And they said they were kicking someone out because he refused to let them go in and do a hanger, a simple hanger inspection. And that, that's a big thing. I are moving someone from the airport and that's not something that I'm looking at doing. Um, but unfortunately we have to comply with the rules that we've really already set in place. Our minimum standards were adopted in 2022, and uh, before I even came to the airport, 
but we have yet to really enact them the way that they were written and the, the with the intention that they were written. So I guess from my perspective, what I'd like to see is I would like to know when you would like to have the policy finalized so that we could have a final vote on on that. I mean, how long, what's, I, your, what's your projected day? I anticipate uh, our, our next first meeting in January is what I'm trying to nail down. January 14th at 1 p.m. Um, is when I plan on having all of the hangar inspections completed. And so hopefully I'll have all of that uh, data to present to the board and we can revisit uh, the policy then. Um, I also just want to have, I make sure I leave enough time to have discussions with more tenants between now and, and that airport board meeting. But I can plan on having this exact same agenda item on the airport board agenda for January. So I guess what we would need is a motion to table item number nine, January 14th, 2025. I make a motion that we table item nine to January 2025. Is there a motion made? Is there a second? Second. A motion made by Member Wallace, seconded by Mr. Young, laid on the table. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. The chair of the ayes have it. Motion passes having received the majority of those appointed to constituting the board. <laughs> Item number 10, airport directors report director. Yes. Airport wide hangar inspections are ongoing. Uh, tenants have been encouraged to make an appointment with the airport administration office. Uh, staff has been able to accommodate most day of request, uh, but appointments don't hurt. Uh, airport maintenance filled in a dip in the road with gravel near gate number two off the airport road. And that's been a, a longstanding issue, I'm told. So if please let us know if there are any issues by that gate that continue to occur. Uh, airport stormwater and drainage discussions are still ongoing uh, due to a proposed development on airport property. Uh, we did have a, a hangar site application submitted for hangar site 23D, and we are still uh, reviewing our stormwater study and hoping to get back to that applicant uh, within the next month. Uh, working with the Guthrie Planning Department to update airport zoning height restrictions uh, near the airport. I'll also be submitting a comment. I, I actually submitted earlier today a comment to the FAA uh, regarding two proposed uh, water towers. One is uh, 0.66 nautical miles uh, south of the runway and one is 0.76 nautical miles north of the runway. Uh, the city has sent a letter to Rural Water District 1 um, and I went ahead and drafted uh, comments to uh, the FAA as well as, as sent my comments to uh, someone else within the FAA obstruction office. Uh, this, this does violate as it reads our height zoning ordinance, um, but that height zoning ordinance also really needs to be updated, which is why we're working on that. Uh, another thing I wanted to say is congratulations to Aronos Flight School. Uh, we held their ribbon cutting on a Wednesday, October 30th at noon in Hangar 2. I also wanted to thank Apex Executive Jet Center and Cloud9 uh, who put together a presentation uh, regarding our airport for the Oklahoma Pilots Association at Wiley Post. Uh, I was going to be absent uh, from that, and uh, Justin stepped in, luckily, at the last minute and filled my place and, and did as well at the, at the uh, Oklahoma Pilots Association. And with that, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Request item number 11, request comments from the airport board. Let's see, I did Ryan one last time, so we'll do Ryan two first. <laughs> that water study got done when I started doing my hangar, and I'm pretty sure that that lot is included in that. In, in, the, in, the, build on, yeah. in the hydrology. I'm about 99% sure it was. There's been more development on our airport that was outside of the existing ALD uh, that was planned when that study was done, I think, in 2018. And so since we've had more development then, the, the results of the study uh, need to be, some of it needs to be updated. 
thought they included all the lots that they had on the master airport plan when they did it, though. They did. As if they were built. Except for the fact that we've had construction now that wasn't on the airport layout drawing back then. Oh, the one hanger behind all that. <clears throat> Don't they have to get a construction permit to build those things? Are they within the city limits? I mean, all the airport things. <laughs> And I'm talking about the water towers. Oh, that's oh, the water towers are outside of city limits. Uh, they're they're in Logan County, but our airport height zoning ordinance is with the city and the county. So we're just notifying the county that they're going to either have to be lowered, or since the water towers are going to have to be moved. With the placement, uh, member Strong's backyard. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> is that all? Yeah. Member Young? Nothing. Uh, Member Strong? Uh, wow. This is like trying to get a drink out of a fire hydrant. I don't know how you're keeping up with it. It's to being a single staff guy. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I did know who, who maintains the website, the webpage? Uh, the city of Guthrie does. It's in long uh, overdue for a remake. Uh, I believe the city's working on updating their website. And so what we're going to look at doing is we'll update both at the same time while we have all the city of Guthrie people that would mess with the website working on it. I, I don't get all wrapped up in those kinds of things as a matter of routine, but my wife does. And she pointed out to me the other day, she says, you see this name is not they're not even there <laughs> not part of the board anymore i said i'll bring it up so but thank you for doing what you're doing this is this is a lot there's a lot um okay that's it i'll stop all right ryan one <clears throat> um i was kind of thinking that uh, we should consider um uh, that maybe the airport director should have a discretionary budget um, to 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 do some of the things that we sometimes vote in here, like this minor software thing, repairs, maintenance. There's, there, I would trust Kate um, to make some of those decisions, and I think that maybe the cities need to need to figure out if, if that's a reasonable thing to do. But I think that a, a discretionary budget would probably help us out in these meetings, so we could focus on more things like setting policy and direction and. Uh, entertain things that would really be more of a, um, a management level decision. Okay. Thank you. So, yep. Mr. Vice Chairman? Uh, nope, nothing else. Okay. I don't have anything since I talked about stole competitions. I will tell you, if you have not been to one, they are an enormous amount of fun. You should, you should take advantage of going to a stole competition in 2025. Obviously, the 2024 year is over, but they start again, I believe, in January. And there are several in this in this area, and they're well worth the entertainment value of going. Um, my brother and I are looking at building a stole plane so that we can compete. What you could build? Uh, uh, Bearhawk. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we're, we're thinking about doing. So they're pretty cool. They're manufactured here in Oklahoma <laughs> in Fairview. Are they always conducted on turf? They are, but they use like between the runways because they only need a very short distance. So like at uh, Sulphur Springs, they don't have a they don't have a grass strip at Sulphur Springs. So between the taxiway and the runway, they they mow a section of it and, and hold it on that. We're going to have less incidents on grass. Oh, sure. I got it. But do you have that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There, there's one pilot who frequently lands between the the curb, the, the runway, and the taxiway. I won't name names. Well, those wheels are about two or three thousand dollars, and they yeah, they're they're not conducive to uh, they wear a runway. Yeah. With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a motion made by Member Wallace, seconded by Member Husky? All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. We stand adjourned. The motion passes. I'm receiving the majority of those appointed to the Constitution. Thank you all. Thank you.